The following presentation was recorded at the Newbury Buddhist Monastery, Victoria, Australia. Please visit our website at nbm.org.au. This morning's talk, and I'll start, uh, it's, it's quite unusual actually. First of all, I was getting used to being without an audience at all, <laughs> just the person or a couple of people recording. So it's very nice now to have people and it's nice to see the committee here, as I say, welcoming the monks who have just come from uh, Perth, from Western Australia, Ajahn Brahm's monastery. You can't see them evidently, but they're like, I can. <laughs> so very good. So I'll start with a, a verse or a gata as we, we usually, I, we oft, I often do, and we usually do in Sri Lanka. It's quite common. So, Garamo chani mato ch santu ti cha katan yuta kale na dhamma savanang etang mangalamutamang sadhu sadhu. And uh, I think many people will know that verse. Uh, I, I usually do it a, 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 um, a question questionnaire here. Who, do people know what that that teaching is from? I know the monks do. <laughs> we do it all the time. Hmm? No, no. It is from the. It, it's a Mangala Sutta, yeah, the Maha Mangala Sutta. And for those who don't know Pali, what it means is that uh, Garavo, respect and humility, Niwato. We have a monk in Perth called Niwato. So humility, nice, isn't it? And then uh, Santuti, contentment and gratitude, Katanyuta and timely listening to the Dhamma, this is the highest blessing. Each of these is the highest blessing. And this is in the Mahamangala Sutta. So the question I have is, which one will it be? <laughs> which are one of these blessings? Because there's a few there. And the, the one that I thought most appropriate today was gratitude. Because, you know, today is a special occasion. We're very grateful for having the new uh, sangha facilities here for the uh, the bhikkhu sangha, the monk sangha. And I wanted to call this talk, Gratitude is more than just an attitude. Gratitude is more than just an attitude. The reason I chose that title is because I know uh, Venerable uh, Buddha Rakata, the African monk, he, called, he has this really neat phrase, that uh, grat the attitude of gratitude. And I think that's, it's very nice, it sounds lovely. But of course, you know, often in English, the word attitude comes with a sort of like a, a negative sense of just having some sort of um, a mental, uh, like phrase one says, it's not coming from the heart. And of course, for gratitude to have, a, to be a positive emotion, to be part of the spiritual practice, it has to come from the heart. So that's the important thing. So that's why I said gratitude is more than just an attitude. So, but of course, the reason I was thinking of gratitude today was because, as I mentioned, because the gratitude for this place, um, the new building here, the Sangha building for the, the monks, the Bhikkhu Sangha, as I mentioned, um, particularly, and for all those that have been involved in it. I know that many people have given so much uh, in make, to make this possible and it's so nice to come here and actually see it being used <laughs> and with furniture and this is the purpose for which it was built and it's so uh, I, that gratitude really extends very much to those that have made this possible by their commitment and in particular I think of Venmo Mudita who who oversaw this project and was in there giving 110 percent and also uh, Rohan and Indira Jaisinga, who are here today, who gave 110%. And this is a full-time um, job almost, building this place. And so it's wonderful to see it being used, and not only being used, but almost full up. We've almost got, we've got five kutis, and I think at the moment we have five monks. So that's pretty good. And this will be the first range retreat here. Uh, the range retreat will begin in July and run till October. So this is wonderful. This is what the place was built for. And uh, so sadhu for that, sadhu, sadhu for that. But of course, you know, we also have the gratitude for all those involved 
um, in making this possible because Newbury uh, I think was first uh, purchased in 2014 I think and they moved in it seems a while ago now doesn't it and uh, all the people involved in that and of course one of the, the big players he's not here today is ex monk jag and I always remember that he said to me that one of the greatest happiness of his life is the sense is the fact that he was able to inspire to get this going, to make this possible, even though he's not here today, you know, and that's a wonderful thing. So the, and it, it doesn't finish there, does it? Because we, <laughs> the, when she, once you buy the property, you have to renovate it. And there was a lot of renovation and uh, a lot of developing the property. But in the end, the most important thing to develop is the community here, isn't it? Really, that's why we're here. It's not for nice buildings and though it's good facilities, essential, because it's quite cold here. <laughs> Particularly the weather can be difficult. But it's for developing, you know, these inequalities of peace, kindness, wisdom, all these things. And, of course, with the Buddhist path, liberation from being reborn again and again. So this is uh, a big thank you, a big sadhu to all those that made, that made it possible. And it's not to forget those that have donated to purchasing this place, to building, uh, um, building these facilities that we have, uh, that we see here today. You'll see a little bit of it on the, on the video. And I'm sure if you want to see more, there, are, there is a video on the BSV website that shows you a beautiful video I've heard that's very, very nice. And not to forget one person who's been instrumental in all of this. Who's that? Ajahn Brahm, absolutely. Sadhu, mega sadhu for him. His unfailing support for this project, Newbury, and this building as well, and without which I think, I doubt that it would have been possible. But also, because it's uh, reflecting on gratitude, we think of all the past members of the BSV that have contributed to the BSV being the BSV. And these are the founders and the people that over the years have given a lot. Uh, and they would be, many of them passed away, they would be saying sadhu, sadhu, that BS, BSV has developed in this way, that it's developed a monastery. Not only that it's developed a monastery, it's developed a place where the, uh, all four sanghas can meet. With the bhikkhu, uh, bhikkhu sangha, the bhikkhuni sangha, the lay and lay men and lay women. This is the fourfold assembly that the Buddha um, created. This was his idea of the fourfold assembly. And uh, so I think of those members, just to mention a few names that have passed away, but of course the one that comes to mind and who I knew was Elizabeth Bell, um, and she was a great um, a contributor to the society. And she contributed not only uh, by supporting it, but by developing the path. Because many of these members, actually, they, they develop these qualities of wisdom, kindness and peace, and she had that very much. And Fred Whittle, we have trees at the BSV for them, <laughs> you can visit them. And Dr. Mervyn Mendes, and of course Metta, uh, Metta Mun, Muni Ratna, Muni Ratna I think is the right, who was fantastic. She, she really um, drove the, she was particularly was president for many years, but also drove the donation, uh, encouraging people to donate to the BSV. So she was really right up to the end. Beatrice, Rebush, and many others that I can't think of. So we are, as it were, standing on their shoulders and they would be very pleased that we are where we are now. So I'd just like to say that, uh, and I think I've emphasized this already, that gratitude is an emotion and it's a spiritual emotion. And happiness, which gratitude leads to, is an incredibly important part for the path, for not only for the path, but for our lives, our daily lives. And happiness is what we're all seeking. And people sometimes seeking it in very strange ways that will lead them to a lot of unhappiness. But this spiritual happiness, this inner happiness, leads to a sense of contentment, leads us towards the direction of the path, which is towards peace, wisdom, compassion, and then liberation. And so I'd just like to, maybe I'll just say a little bit about what the 
the word, uh, the word, the Pali word for compassion, for not compassion, <laughs> for, for gratitude, is katanyuta. And sometimes it's expressed in the phrase katanyu katavedi, and that usually translates as thanks or gratitude for what we have received, what has been done. And uh, so this is a very important aspect of the Buddha's path. And I'll, I'll mention a quote from the Buddha. He said, these two monks, these two people are hard to find in the world. What two? And he mentions the one who is first to do a favor. This is somebody who does something without being asked, hopefully what you want. <laughs> they called a pubakari, pubakari, someone who does before you ask. And one who is grateful what, for what is done. These are the two persons hard to find in the world. So this gratitude, we may not be so familiar with it. This is why it's a very important teaching in a way. And it's, to me, it's easy happiness. It's an easy way to develop positive qualities in our lives. And some of the English translations we can use that may be more meaningful for people are things like appreciation, of course being thankful is one, or grateful is another, feeling of being blessed, or I like uh, lucky. I use them in a minute, I'll, I'll do a little guided meditation, I'm so lucky. Ajahn Brahm said to me, it's good, but the eyes are the problem. <laughs> I like that. I agree with him, actually. The eyes are always the problem, actually. So maybe just so lucky. <laughs> we are so lucky. So we can start. This is, this is a very practical. It will be a, quite a hands-on or experiential sort of uh, Dhamma talk. We can start by a little meditation so we can please... Close your eyes and come into the present moment. We can do that by just being aware of the body sitting, aware of the posture, and just relaxing the body from the head, giving it a mental massage, is what I call it, from the head to the toes. Just a quick mental massage. And I'd like you to bring to mind your reaction to when you hear, I'm so lucky. What things make you feel? I'm so lucky. It can be a person, a situation in our lives, our health, or the ending of some difficulty. Even the ending of or uh, easing of the restrictions from the COVID-19 outbreak. I'm so lucky. And we can get in touch with how we feel. What's the feeling? Is there a feeling uh, that comes up? when we think of this particular situation, I'm so lucky. And now we can come out of the meditation and open our eyes and relax our bodies. So the first thing is, no, now those questions come. <laughs> how, did, you, did you feel, how did you feel when with that phrase, I'm so lucky? Uh, did it bring up happiness for you? Did you feel a happy feeling? That warm, expansive feeling we often get when we feel grateful, when we feel thankful. Um, and uh, it doesn't matter whether it be a person or a situation. And I call this, as I mentioned before, free happiness. When we know that this trigger of thinking of this particular situation, it'll change 
or this person or whatever can bring up this happiness. We have got one of the triggers for our positive emotions, how to develop them when we um, need to bring up this happiness, which is in, we need actually for our lives, our daily lives, but also for the meditation. If one uh, heard that phrase, I'm so lucky, and one thought, no, <laughs> that's, I don't feel that, <laughs> then perhaps that's not the right trigger for you. It may be another phrase. It's always good, whatever our reaction, there's no, no possibility of getting it wrong. We can investigate. If we are very, because the, the Dhamma is about being truthful, being honest about our experience and then investigating it. If something, if we hear, I'm so lucky, and a negative reaction comes up, Ah, great. Can investigate. Why is that? What is the what's what's this? What what is the reason that I don't feel lucky? I don't feel blessed by in in when I hear that phrase. But if it does work for you, that phrase, I'm so lucky. It does for me actually. I love it. Um, then you can use it as a mantra. Not only in meditation. I, I combine it with the breath and uh, use that as a mantra and then let go of it when it's done its job or bringing out peace, bringing the mind together. But you can use, we can use that in daily life as well. So it's very useful just to remember. And it's amazing how the mind can turn around when we start to look at the things in our lives that we're grateful for rather than what's going wrong according to our idea. You know, this is, it shouldn't be like this. You know, the relationship's not, not going well. The job's not going well. You know, this virus business is really making my life difficult or uh, leading to a lot of suffering for me. So we can use it to really refocus the mind. It's quite a powerful tool for that. And this is very important in Buddhism. And it's not only just to feel good, it's to take it, uh, to use this as a basis for our practice, for where we're coming from. Too often, you know, it can become, as it were, when we develop uh, this inner happiness from gratitude, from metta, any of the positive, positive emotions, this can become our default position from where we come from. And my goodness, it's a good default position, actually. <laughs> it's a good setting to have. So... And uh, some people might think that when we, you know, that gratitude or being appreciative is really for the other person's benefit, you know, so that, you know, they feel good. And I know plenty of people tell me, oh, I did this for this person, I did that. And they didn't even say, thank you. <laughs> and they're very disappointed. I said, don't let them, don't let that, you know, uh, uh, defile or reduce your happiness from doing that giving, uh, whatever form of giving it is. But of course, the first person who benefits from gratitude is ourselves. We're experiencing it, so we will get the benefit. Um, and uh, of course, you know, if we do actually say to the person, or if there is a person involved, uh, if we actually say to them, yes, thank you very much, that really made a difference, then not only will that person feel very good, but it'll actually increase our happiness as well. So this is a, and psychologists are very, very keen on gratitude. I think many people on the internet are probably, they're, they're probably gratituded out. <laughs> they hear about it. But really it's how we develop, that's the, develop gratitude in a sincere, genuine way that's important. But I know psychologists encourage people, there's lots of different approaches to keep journals and so on. And one of them is three blessings. So every day, that you're supposed to write down three things that you think are a blessing in your life and why. And I think that's such a, it is such a powerful way. If you're having a bad day, just start thinking of something that is really good in your life, you know, something that, uh, that you're thankful for, that you're grateful for. That will change the whole day. <laughs> change. It's in, really interesting to see, see that happen. And uh, it's very, very useful, of course, from the psychological point of view for depression. And this is what the psychologists are aiming at. And of course, somebody that does this on a regular basis, daily basis, they're reconditioning the mind so that the, the sense of gratitude, this happiness and gratitude is replacing, reducing that depression. So it's a very, very useful 
um, to develop this psychologically, but it has to be genuine. I can imagine many of these people think, oh my God, what have I got to be grateful for today? <laughs> you know, they probably think like that. So, so very useful. And gratitude is looking at what we already have. In actual fact, the reality is in our lives, we have more than enough. And even sometimes people are in difficult situations and the, the reality is still they have a lot that is good in their lives. And rather than what we want, you know, in, from life and what we, because act, in actual fact, what we've got is probably much more than uh, we need, but it also brings us that happiness and undermi undermines the worry about the future and the anxiety. And I like this, the comment Ajahn Brahm made. He's got such brilliant uh, one-liners, they're fantastic. And his was, happiness, and this is the same for gratitude really, is not having what you like, it's liking what you have. And that's so true, isn't it? And I'll say it again, happiness is not having what you like, that's what we all think, we'll be happy when we have what we like. It's liking what we have. And we can be immediately happy if we like what we already have. If we have to have what we like in order to be happy, we are postponing happiness until we get that. Maybe we don't get that. <laughs> so it's a powerful antidote for wanting to this uh, gratitude. So it's a really, it's, it's not a light thing. You know, many people think, oh, gratitude, oh, thanks, you know, just a small thing. It's not a small thing, actually. It's a powerful uh, quality to develop. And as I was saying uh, on the way here to Newbury today, you know, we human beings, even though we, we don't feel like it often, we come from a sense of, of me and self and all that sort of thing. We are this body. And this mind is a conditioned phenomena. But what we want to do is have good conditioning. <laughs> conditioning that leads to happiness and well-being, not to negative consequences like anxiety and depression and many other things. So I'd just like to talk about a bit about what is gratitude and then, uh, yes, got a bit of time. And as I mentioned, it's not just an attitude. It's much more than that. It has to be. Um, to, to have a real effect, it has to be genuine, has to be sincere, coming from our hearts. But it's part of the Buddhist path. People might say, well, where is it in the Buddhist path? Welcome, Ajahn Chittapala, please. Where does gratitude occur in, occur in the Buddhist path? And of course, it comes in a number of places, really, when you think about it. It's part of right view, in a sense, in, in, uh, when we think of karma. When we think of karma, this is good karma. It will give rise to good effects, good fruit. It's also part of a right intention. And this is the uh, intention or motivation, Ajahn Brahm's calling it, samasankapa. And it, it comes in the sense of... Uh, non-ill will. It's a positive quality of mind. We usually think of metta for that, and that's fine, but it's any positive quality, and that includes uh, katanyata, gratitude. And of course, uh, it comes also in right intention, because right intention on the Buddha's path is letting, uh, avoiding and letting go of negative states of mind, negative emotions particularly, and arousing positive states of mind, positive emotions, and developing them, maintaining them. So this is, um, fits in very well in, in uh, right effort too. And it's a sense, as I mentioned, of appreciation. One of the nice uh, phrases they use in English, a bit, bit old, old fashioned perhaps, is counting our blessings. <laughs> but it's true actually, I think counting our blessings is quite true. And the lovely thing about uh, uh, um, gratitude is that it's the opposite of fault finding. It reduces that fault finding mind, just as metta does. Because metta, uh, loving kindness or friendliness, as I like to call it these days, is that seeing the positive, seeing, seeing the good in ourselves and in others. So it reduces the fault finding mind. But so does this gratitude, actually, because we realize how, how much we owe to others, how much we owe to life, how much we owe 
to situations that we often take for granted. And this is, a, um, this is one of the, uh, one of the uh, things that undermines uh, gratitude, and particularly you know, when we, uh, in our day-to-day -day lives, is that we can take others for granted. And we have that saying in English, don't we? Familiarity breeds contempt. And of course, with the COVID-19 uh, outbreak, you know, people have been spending a lot of time together. And so this can be, in a way, it can undermine that sense of gratitude because the familiarity is there and our minds very conditioned to find fault, find what's wrong, what could be better, either with ourselves <laughs> or others, or, or the situations we find ourselves in. So I'd like to, there's a nice story from Nasrudin, because I have to have at least one <laughs> Nasrudin story per, per talk, otherwise people say, what happened to the Nasrudin story? Wow, well, I forgot it. And in this story, Nasrudin was walking, his, and Nasrudin, for those who don't know, um, was a Sufi teacher I think in, they say in Turkey, but he's be, it's supposed to have been uh, supposed to have been a historical person. But there's a whole genre of stories that have grown up that are probably <laughs> probably later developments. But this one is a very nice one, and I like these. These stories really resonate with me. I don't know why, but they do. Maybe from the past. Uh, Nasrudin is walking along a road, and one day, and he meets another traveller who's walking along the road, and this man says to him, he says. Oh, he says, nothing interests me in life. I'm so bored and uh, I don't have to work and um, I'm just traveling to find something more interesting and like lightning. Nasruddin grabs his bag and runs off and he takes shortcuts. There's lots of bends in the road. takes shortcuts, gets way ahead of the man and the man is totally distressed he can't catch up with Nazareth. He's totally everything he, you know, he needs is in that bag. And he's totally, totally distressed. And then Nazareth gets ahead on the road and he puts the bag in the middle of the road. And this man, absolutely depressed, you know, and uh, thinking, my goodness, what can I do? He's walking along the road. He sees the bag. He goes, oh, the bag. And he's so overjoyed. And he rushes up, grabs the bag. And Nazareth pops out of the bush and says, are you still bored? <laughs> Are you still bored? And it's true. This is a very good way of developing gratitude. When something's not there, when somebody's not there, when some situation is not there, like our job, for instance, well, then we can really develop this sort of gratitude. Uh, it brings it up very strongly. So this is a, a way that we can can, uh, as I say, we can often take people for granted in the family, our friends, uh, until they're not there and then we can appreciate them. And it can be very useful uh, in order to develop gratitude to actually uh, think that the person has gone away or they've died, if they've died. So it's a temporary um, separation or a permanent separation. And when we do that, it's a very good way to bring up gratitude, actually. It's a very, very good way. So I will do, I wonder if I've got enough time for it. I was going to do another, uh, another, yeah, I might do this one, I think. This is another experiment. <laughs> it's another meditation. So we can try again and use this, use this approach that I just mentioned um, to bring up uh, gratitude, to rekindle it in situations <laughs> where it may have got a bit, bit sort of, uh, lukewarm, lukewarm. So we can come into the present moment and close our eyes and use the body to ground ourselves in the present moment. It's always present, the posture. And giving it a good mental massage. And just imagine that you are separated from your partner or your children or your parents or your friends. Maybe it's a temporary separation or maybe they have died, passed away. 
Even if they're living, we can think, well, one day they will die. One day I will die. Just bring someone to mind. Just think, I may never see them again. And get in touch with a feeling that comes up when you think of being separated from that person, temporarily or permanently. And now we can slowly come out of the meditation. So, just to ask everybody on the, they can answer for yourself, you'll know for yourself. Did you feel more grateful for that person or not? Or it occurred to me actually that sometimes we can actually maybe feel sad because we hadn't really thought that yes, one day we will be separated uh, permanently. So, but for me, you know, that gratefulness, that gratitude comes up too when I think, ah, oh, I may not see that person again. And it really undermines that sense of taking them for granted. You know, they'll always be there. <laughs> they won't. <laughs> and that's for sure. They won't. Because the, uh, one of the Buddha's t teachings is that in one of the, the, the core threads of reality is impermanence, anicca, or anitya in Sinhala, anitya. And this is that everything is transient, that it's passing away, sometimes much more quickly on a moment-to-moment -moment basis sometimes. Everything is not certain, it's not stable, it's not reliable. And when we take that, uh, I like the phrase actually, nothing lasts, that's my, one of my favourite translations for anitya, is nothing lasts. And when we have that feeling, then we value what we're experiencing much, much more. Because I mean, that's the reality, actually. And the reality is that, you know, of course, there are all these people in our lives, but a journey on the freeway, going to work, coming home, wherever they're going, may not come home, may not go to work, get to work, and it happens. So it's very good to be grateful, to, use, to develop these uh, appreciation while the person is still alive, you know. Uh, and, and not wait until they pass away. And then, of course, it's, it's, there can be all the attachments that lead to a sense of sadness when a person passes away. So that's a, um, a very important thing to take into mind, uh, to keep in mind, sorry. Anicca, impermanence, nothing lasts. It puts everything in perspective, actually, <laughs> quite nicely. And one of the emphases of the Buddha's teaching I was going to mention too is on experience, direct experience. And I think, um, you know, these meditations, these uh, short meditations are aimed at that. We get a direct experience for ourselves because in the end, direct experience is what we're aiming at. Um, the Buddha's teachings are a guide to that. But of course, the Buddha's wisdom is his wisdom. <laughs> we have to grow our own wisdom, but he's given us some very good pointers, and very good directions on how to do that, where to look. The other thing that uh, makes, uh, that can reduce uh, gratitude or make us ungrateful, and this is a very, very common one, is expectation. Expectation. You know, expecting uh, of more of life, expecting a lot from others, it can make us quite ungrateful, you know, because they're not, they're, we're not getting what we, we feel we deserve. We're not getting what we want. And uh, people are not living up to our expectations. Maybe. We're not living up to our expectations. That's usually the biggie, actually. We don't live up to our expectations and we can be very harsh on ourselves. And I would ask people, what, does, what is another word for expectation? 
It, it is very much, but it's a much more common word. Craving. Craving, it's wanting, yeah. It's funny, a lot of these words we don't realize they're just other forms <laughs> of wanting, of craving, of tanha. They are. And of course, you know, expectation is a great way to sabotage our experience of happiness. Uh, a great way to sabotage meditation too, when we make demands of the meditation, uh, have it, these expectations, and it will derail it in a big way. So I'd like to I'd give a, 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 it's a joke actually, <laughs> I've told it before but I will tell. Two old friends met and uh, one, one of them looked very glum and uh, the other friend said to him, what's up, what's the problem? And he said, well, Three weeks ago, my uncle died, and he left me $50,000 in his will. Well, that's good, isn't it? And then he said, well, two weeks ago, my cousin died, and they left me 100000 in their will. Well, that's pretty good, too. And then he said, and, and last week, my grandmother died, and she left me half a million dollars. <laughs> so, what's the problem? This week, nothing's happened. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that brilliant? <laughs> it's quite a good joke because it points to exactly what, uh, what expectation does, you know. All, this, all, that, uh, all those inheritance that person got and yet that was lost, was derailed, the happiness was gone because this week nothing, hasn't been anything, no one's died. <laughs> And, uh, of course, one of the big incentives in our practice is, is always to see the benefit. And this is what I encourage with meditation. You know, when we reflect, we review at the end of the, each meditation, we think, well, you know, what, what's happened? And hopefully we've seen benefit, we've seen that there are developments in the meditation. Because when we see there's benefit in what we're doing, whatever we're doing, we will develop it, we will do more of it. Uh, and uh, this is the case with meditation. And as I mentioned, the benefit of course is that gratitude leads very much to contentment. They're very similar, they're very closely linked emotions actually. What we're grateful for, what we're thankful for, leads to this sense of not needing, not wanting, which is the essence of contentment. Realising, yeah, hey, we've got I've got enough. You know, I don't need more to make me happy. And it gives rise to this, uh, this sense of uh, mental well-being, of having enough, as I mentioned. And um, very much, too, when we have this gratitude, one of the benefits is that when things are tough, when we're having a really bad hair day, I don't know if they use that term anymore, it's pretty old-fashioned, then we can remember the thing, something in our life that's that we're grateful for, we're thankful for. Sometimes when we're in a negative space, that can be hard. Oh, one thing, even just one thing, but we can. And that puts everything into perspective. And of course, that's the essence of counting our blessings. So I have another Nasruddin story, which I think I've told before too, but nevertheless. I have got another new one that I haven't told. But <laughs> doesn't fit the context. One day, Nasruddin's donkey vanished, it disappeared. And uh, this donkey was uh, his friend, for one thing. It was also his, his vehicle or transport. And also, it was good for when he went to market. He could carry everything he needed to market on the donkey. So the villagers knew how important this donkey was to Nasruddin. And so they searched for the donkey everywhere. They went a long way into the surrounding area to find the donkey. And they searched and searched, but couldn't find the donkey. It had vanished, it had gone, it disappeared. And they went back and they thought, oh, this is going to be really upset Nasruddin. And they went back and they told Nasruddin, they thought he'd be lamenting and, and uh, really upset. And later that night in the village, they heard these cries of, thank you, Sounds like Ajahn Brahm, doesn't it? Thank you, thank you. And they came out of their houses. And yes, it was Nasrud. And they thought, my God, he's gone mad. <laughs> he's just lost his donkey. Why is he saying thank you? And they said, Nasrud, what's up? Why are you so thankful? And he said, ah, I'm so thankful that I wasn't on the donkey when it disappeared. <laughs>
I think that's a fantastic story because it, it shows how you can, uh, be, can uh, develop thankfulness, gratitude from almost anything. And actually it points to a deeper, a deeper uh, aspect too that a lot of the things we can be grateful for are the things that are not happening in our lives. I'm not sick. I'm, maybe I have a job. I'm not without a job. Um, I have a partner. We, we, I'm not divorced. I'm, we're not broken up. Um, you know, many, many things. We, when we reflect, ah, I don't have this in my life. So that gives sense of gratitude. I have food. <laughs> you know, so this gives sense to a grat gratitude that we have these things. And uh, as I often like what Ajahn Brahm says about contentment, so it's very true for gratitude that it is the fast track to enlightenment. And why is that? Because it derails, as I mentioned with a gratitude, it derails wanting, craving, desire, and reduces what we want. Um, and it's an, as I it's a say, it's an antidote to wanting. And because it's an antidote to wanting, it also deals with a lot of the negativity in the mind that happens when we don't get what we want. That's when uh, viapada or ill will, anger comes up. So it's a, uh, a very uh, important emotion that this contentment, particularly and the gratitude that can lead to contentment. But contentment's also great. Uh, the gratitude is also great because in these days, you know, you often hear people feel, and particularly with the COVID-19 virus, people feel so isolated. And there may be people who are, you know, living on their own, not seeing anybody, you know, just going to the shops and uh, not having any real contact. And one of the, the big ad advantages of gra developing gratitude, it creates a sense of connection, of relationship to others, uh, appreciating what others do. I mean, if we are stranded in our homes, we can always be thankful for all the things that are provided. We still have food, there's electricity still, there's light, there's warmth. I have clothing, I have uh, medicines, and I have a shelter, you know, these things. But it's a great antidote for loneliness too, because we feel connected to others and separation. I know when I lived on my own in a cave in Sri Lanka for eight years, I rarely felt lonely. It was because of that sense, not only of gratitude, but of uh, loving kindness, friendliness, of feeling close to people, even though physically they were far away. But often it can be the case, sometimes it can be the case that people are close to each other, but emotionally distant, far away. And so whoever we bring to mind, whoever's in our heart, we're close to them, no matter how far away we are or how close we are. And this is, very, this is a very important lesson that I learned from that. And it creates a, um, a sense of empathy for others too. We are more aware of where others' feelings are, what their feelings are. So these are important aspects for our own happiness and spiritual development as well. And as I mentioned, when we are grateful, there's much less of the fault-finding mind and this is, improves our lives immediately actually and leads to making metta very, very easily. And it's getting close to the end, so I might just mention uh, meditation and, uh, and then we can conclude. Yeah, I think that's good. So medita in meditation, why, why develop gratitude? Because gratitude will lead, when we develop a positive state of mind, it leads to the negative states of mind, the hindrances that block meditation, block wisdom, reducing. Um, and uh, those negative states of mind the Buddha talks about, a desire, ill will, dullness and drowsiness, agitation and worry and doubt, those five. And uh, these block the meditation, as I said, and insight. But gratitude, it leads to the sense of contentment. Contentment is that feeling of having enough, of not needing anything. And of course, when the mind has a sense of not needing anything, there's nowhere to go. Of course, you know, craving, wanting, 
makes us really busy <laughs> and the mind has to move. I want to get into jhana. I want to get deep meditation. I want this. I want that. What happened? <laughs> so this contentment with whatever we're experiencing in the meditation, in the moment, the now, leads to the mind becoming stiller and stiller, leads to the mind becoming one-pointed. And it's coming, becoming one-pointed because it's happy to be here, the sense of gratitude, contentment, means we're happy to be here we're happy we don't want to go anywhere else when you're having a good time who wants to to move and the mind is the same when it is really happy then it can come together and we can have this one pointedness and once the mind has experienced that one pointedness then the defilements the negative states of mind completely uh, subdued for a time and then wisdom can really develop. We can really see things clearly without, without the uh, obscurations of greed, wanting things in a particular way, ill will, not wanting stuff to be like this, uh, without drowsiness and uh, without agitation and restlessness and without doubt, without those. We can really see what's going on and then wisdom can develop, and then insights can come. So that is the purpose in meditation, the use in meditation. And as I say, I like to encourage people when they're using a meditation object to combine that meditation object with a positive emotion, albeit, you know, in this case, gratitude, this feeling of thanks, of being grateful. So I'd like to... There was more, but of course there always is. Conclude by encouraging all of us to develop, um, a, develop more thankfulness in our lives, to use it, to experiment with it, to see how it can really change a day, how it can be like a rainbow in, in our day when the day looks pretty dark, how it can be like a beam of light in our um, our lives, especially when things are difficult, and. To make a habit of it, this is a good habit to develop. We have many other habits. <laughs> These are, this is a good habit. And uh, it will reduce our fault finding. We will find that life is richer, more enjoyable um, and more positive. And that it will support, we'll feel happier in ourselves when we develop more and more of this. And that the path will really open up because the path develops when our negative states of mind, our negative emotions are reduced, reduced and lessened and lessened and then the path becomes obvious and we can develop the path to wisdom, insight and, and compassion too. I say when we develop wisdom we always get compassion because we understand we're all in the same boat and then we, f we have a feeling, we have empathy for other situations too. But more than that, in a Buddhist context, we can develop the wisdom, the insight that liberates us from being born again and again. So I'd like to thank you for listening to the talk today. And I know I've seen a sign that says, received questions. <laughs> so, if, so now it's time for uh, some questions before we have the uh, meal at quarter to 11 or 11. I'm not sure. Yeah, we'll try and make it a bit earlier, but see. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ajahn. Thank you for your being the symbol of calmness. So grateful for your teaching. We are so lucky. Yeah, <laughs> thank, thank you, thank you very you. much. <laughs> so we do have three questions. Yeah. Oh, that's good. That's not too much. They are all related. I will just uh, say out the question first and let you to answer. Yeah. First one. What do you think the use of count our blessings to justify oppressive authorities, such as someone tell a child, happy to have food on our table mm. when a parent is abusive? Yes. Second question, how can I be grateful when seeing things as they are? Third one, how can I be grateful without being judgmental? Good, bad, who knows, is not it. All right. So if you we do it one by one, the first question. Sure. Yeah. The first one. What do you think the use of count our blessings to justify oppressive authorities? 
No, that won't work at all because to, that, is, that is a misuse of, uh, of that idea of gratitude, you know. Um, you cannot force another person to, have, to be grateful for something. And particularly, it's not possible if the, other, the person that is doing it is abusive, is, is trying to force the person to be grateful for so something that is actually abusive. No, I think, uh, of course, with Dhamma, we need to be honest, we need to be truthful, so we, we acknowledge what the situation is. And then, I liked, uh, I mentioned it on the way up, actually, Ayakima's uh, um, uh, formula she had for this. She acknowledge, um, no blame, and then change. No blame. So... That is a very useful way of dealing with situations that are abusive. We acknowledge that it's happened. Blaming really, if we start blaming others or blaming ourselves is a big one too, it really detracts from actually finding healing, finding resolution. It's not going to bring any satisfaction. They, you know, they abused me, the Buddha said, you know, they, they um, harmed me, they beat me. He said, if we think like that, we will not come to peace. We can't come to peace. But if we can let go of the blaming game, as I call it, and then focus on change, what we can do in the future. So I'd say that, definitely not uh, uh, trying to use gratitude as a way of, of um, uh, making abuse okay. It's never okay. So that's good. Thank you. Thank you. Second, Second question, one? yes. How can I be grateful while seeing things as they are? How can I be grateful when thing, seeing things as, as they, they are. are? Well, when you, I don't think, uh, once, you, once you see things as they are, in Buddhist terms anyway, that's, that's seeing reality. That's seeing the fact that nothing lasts, that there is unsatisfactoriness or uh, suffering in life and, and also seeing that there is not self. But in order to get to that, we need to abandon the negative states of mind that make it impossible to see things as they truly are. So in a sense, gratitude has done its job once we are seeing things as they truly are. There are no negative states of mind because if there are any negative states of mind, we're not seeing things truly as they are. We're wanting things to be other than they are, <laughs> or you know, or not liking what we are experiencing. But seeing things truly as they are, gratitude has done its job. It's got us there. That happiness has led to the mind coming together, being still, uh, uh, letting go of all negative qualities, and then being able to see things as they truly are. And it, I always liked what Ayakima used to say. She said, you know, happiness is so important in the, the path because it's that happiness that gives you a foundation for when, in, when you see insight, it may not be exactly what you would like to see. It's as it, as it truly is. But it gives you this firm stability of happiness, a foundation that won't be rocked by what, what we see uh, when we develop uh, insight. So I'd say it's done its job. <laughs> and then you could be grateful for that insight that has occurred, you know, that's, that's something later. Later one can be, oh, very grateful. Where did that come from? The Buddha. Fire <laughs> a few other, other teachers perhaps on the way. All right, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. The last one is actually related to the one that you just mentioned. How can I be graceful without being judgmental? Good, bad, who knows? It's not it. Without being judgmental. When we're grateful, we're ge generally not uh, judgmental. I think it'd be pretty hard to be judgmental when we're grateful. If we're grateful, we're really sincerely touched by what other people have done for us or what life has done for us or, you know, what the Buddha's teachings offered us, you know. Um, so I would say that... Uh, no, we wouldn't be judgmental. It would tend to reduce, like like uh, metta or maitri, friendliness, loving kindness. When we develop that, then we tend not to judge. We're seeing the good in people. We're seeing the good in ourselves. We're seeing, as Ajahn Brahm says, the right, what's right about ourselves and others. 
So I, I don't, I think they're incompatible really um, because it, judgmental, if we're judgmental, it will reduce gratitude, it will, it will derail gratitude actually. Why be grateful <laughs> if we judge somebody as having said or done something that's just completely unacceptable, gratitude goes out the window and friendliness and loving kindness goes out the window and fault finding becomes the main agenda. So thank you for that question. I hope that answers it, but I think that's what I would say. Incompatible, <laughs> hopefully. I can't think of a situation where they would come together. Thank, thank you. you unless, unless one judges oneself and says, I'm not grateful enough, <laughs> <laughs> which will also derail the judgmental, uh, derail the gratitude. So thank you very much for this morning, and I think it's time that we uh, finished and we can pay respects to the Buddha, Dhamma and the Sangha.